As we enter into our sermon this morning, we, we are in the, the first letter to the church at Corinth, chapter 14. And in, in, in chapter 14, 14 talks about gifts of tongues and gifts of prophecy. And in, in, the, in the church today, in, in the many different denominations, in the many different parts of, of, of our church, uh, tongues and, and prophecy can bring about a lot of controversy. It can bring about a lot of conflict. A lot of people have disagreements about what tongues are. And a lot of people have disagreements about what prophecy is. But Paul, as Paul, Paul spends a good portion of his time in the book of Corinth trying to explain prophecy and trying to explain tongues. And, and instead of reading the, the whole chapter, I'm actually just going to hit a, a few points in it. But, but as we begin, let, let's talk about tongues for a second. What, what do you think tongues are? Now, biblically in the world, tongues are languages. They, they are uh, prayers. Uh, biblically, Paul, Paul, Paul addresses tongues in, in, in two ways, in, in two types. One is, is, is actual languages that we have here on the earth that, is, that are, are used to show the sinner and the lost that God is rich. He uses instances where, where people of different languages can come together and, and, and then someone will speak and, and as in the book of Acts, everyone would hear what the, what the speaker was saying in their own language. That, that, would, that would be tongues. Uh, he also says in, in, in this chapter that he speaks in 10,000 tongues. But also, he, he says, better to speak four words of prophecy than 10,000 tongues if it would help. So, tongues, tongues, according to the Apostle Paul, is a way for individuals to lift up their spirits to God. They, they are a form of communication with, with God in, in the fact that your mind and your knowledge and your words do not get in the way. But that, that's the different kinds of tongues that Paul talks about. And then there's prophecy. What is prophecy? Well, prophecy is an interesting word. And different churches define its meaning in different ways. Some churches call prophecy predicting the future. Telling, telling someone what's going to happen to them in the future. Or telling a nation what's going to happen to the nation in the, in, in the future. Uh, some people call prophecy... Prophecy is speaking the word of God. So, you know, kind of like preaching. A lot of people equate prophecy and preaching as the same thing. But one of, one of the most interesting definitions of prophecy that I encountered th this week was, was as follows. It is the revelation of God's truth in the lives of the people. So prophecy would, would be you understanding God's word in your life. So whoever speaks a prophecy of someone is someone who helps you understand that. Or you helping someone else understand that would be a prophecy. So, yeah, yeah, so as, as a church as a whole, we have different definitions of these words. So... Uh, regardless of, of, of your background, regardless of, of how you feel about tongues, regardless of how you feel about prophecy, the Apostle Paul teaches, and the, the Word of God gives us instructions and directions on how they're supposed to be used. He says in, in verse 1, or verse 4, I'm sorry, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, in verse 5, he says, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets 
so that the church may be built up. So uh, according to the Apostle Paul's teaching, the, the gift of tongues can and it is at times appropriate to be used in, in a church setting, provided there's an interpretation. Uh, but it's better to prophesy. And why is it better to prophesy than to speak in tongues? Based off the definitions I, I just gave you a moment ago, prophecy is the building up of the church. As one prophesies, he delivers or she delivers messages to the people of God that bring them closer to God. Both as individuals, as congregations, as peoples, as cities, as towns, as nations, prophecies, you can see a prophecy come to pass. You can witness them with your own eyes and know that God said it and it happened. So, if we, we look at today in our, in, in our country, if we, if we look at our country and, and look at the events that have been taking place over the last 60 years, we see a tremendous amount of the words of the prophets, the words of the preachers, words of the, uh, of the pastors that are now coming to pass. Much, much like we read a few moments ago in, in uh, Judges. In, in Judges 10, verse 7 said, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites. And they were crushed, oppressed, and the people of Israel in that year, for 18 years they were oppressed, and all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan and the land of the Ammonites, which is Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim. So Israel was severely distressed. And the people cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, did I not save you from the Egyptians, from the Amorites, from the Ammonites, from the Philistines, from the Sidonians, from the Amalekites and the Moanites? Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore I will save you no more. You know, the thing about prophecy, the thing about the Word of God, the thing about reading the Holy Bible is when you learn what God did, you know what God's going to do. You know how God reacts when His people reject Him? Have you been watching the news for the past 60 years? Have, have you seen how God treated the Israelites when they rebelled, when they refused to obey, when they refused to live according to His instruction? What did, what did it say He did to them? Verse 7. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines. He sold them into the hands of the Ammonites. He oppressed the people. And for 18 years he oppressed them. You know, there, there are points in time when God says, that's enough. When God looks at the people who claim to know Him and love Him and say, you want to serve your own gods? Fine, go ahead. And He lets them reap the rewards of what they've done. Now, if, if prophecy is the revelation of God's Word or God's truth in our lives, then what can that say about our nation right now? What do we see happening in, in, in our country? You know, 60 years ago, we banned, our, our people banned prayer from our schools. And in the last 60 years, we have taken God out of absolutely everything that involves the public. We have forbidden the use of the name of Jesus in, in prayer in schools and in, in, in public spots. And over the course of that 60 years, what have we seen happen? We have seen... We have seen the amount of crime 
increase. We have seen violence go to proportions that's never been seen in the world. People are being murdered all over the place all the time. We see the amount of rape and abuse and, 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 and people being tormented and hurt and taken advantage of at, at levels that history can it hasn't even recorded yet. God said, when you turn your back on me, okay. When in, in your own personal lives, when when you turn your back to God. Look at the things that happen to you. The Word of God says He'll let you. You'll suffer oppression. You'll suffer conviction. You will suffer hard times. You will you you will go through times of, of barrenness. You will thirst. You will hunger. You will suffer sickness and you will suffer disease. When, when we as individuals choose to turn our backs to God and God's will, sometimes His anger handles against us. Throughout Throughout Scripture, throughout the ages, for 6,000 years of recorded history, we have the story of Israel. And time and time again, Israel would disobey God. They would rebel. They would refuse Him. They would deny Him. And He allowed them to fall into oppression. And every time when they would repent, when they would turn back to Him, when they would call upon His name, He would save them. I'm not making this up. It's really cool. It's right there. But you look at our nation today. You look and see what we've done as a people. I'm not talking about you as individuals. I'm talking about as a nation. You look at what we've done. How much longer are we as a nation going to be able to stand against an almighty God who created that? You look at the news. You look at the weather. You look at the earthquakes. You look at the disasters that are coming upon our nation. Do you honestly think we are pleasing our God? Do you think our nation is in God's good side right now? You look at our land, even here in the, in the Bible Belt of the, the United States of America, we are suffering a drought that we haven't seen in almost a hundred years. He has withheld the rain from us. And in consequence of the no rain, He is burning, smoking us out. Now I know there, there are many, many people who say, God is a loving God and God wouldn't do that. Word of God is truth. I can say that, and I can say everything I've just said because I, He's done it before. I don't have to think about global warming. Global warming is a scientific term; they just come up with it. God figured that stuff out millennia ago. God said, when you, as a people, when you refuse me, when you deny me, I will send famines. I will send disease. I will allow you to suffer all that you want to suffer. Now the prophetic, the prophetic word in that is if we repent as a nation, if we call upon God, he will forgive us. He will forgive our nation. He will restore our nation. Restore our nation 
the grace of God. Now why is this important? Because this is important for this reason, folks. It doesn't matter how much you love Jesus and how much grace that you have and how saved you are. You live in a world that is broken by sin. You live in a culture that says sin is okay. And over the course of time, people have come to accept the sin as normal. And they don't even call it a sin anymore. People have got to the point where they say God is outdated and God is archaic and God, God, there, there is no God. How much more is God going to have to do to us before we open our eyes and see that He's real? It's more than our personal relationship. How many of you understand you're a sinner? And Adam and Eve sinned against God. Everything that came from them was broken by sin. In case you don't know this, Adam and Eve were the first. There was none before them, so everything that came since then broken by sin. That includes every living person that exists. Do you think you're a good person? Do you think you're a nice person? Do you think you do what's right? Do you think you do what's just and what's holy? Compared to what? The Word of God is the truth. You look at our country. The only country in the world that for over 200 years has had a peaceful exchange of power from one president to the next president. From one king to the next king. Time and time and time. But you look at what's happening now. People are upset because what they wanted to happen didn't. So in their righteousness, in their holiness, in their niceness, in their goodness, in their loving their neighborness, they've marched out onto the streets destroyed buildings, flipped cars, rolled fireballs at people. All in the name of love and tolerance and patience and forgiveness. And we should accept everybody for everything and we shouldn't question anything anybody does. Except when it's not our way. Can you honestly think that God is pleased with our nation? The word, the, the prophecy, the word of God coming to pass in our own land. Can you see? Can you see God's anger? Can you see God's hurt? Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you, only please deliver us. Here's your prophetic word. As long as our nation stands in sin and ignores God, 
He will continue to oppress us. He will continue to distress us as a nation. He will continue to allow the suffering. He will let us fix it ourselves. We're doing a really good job of that. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. says, what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise and my, with my spirit, but I will sing praise with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in a position, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving? What, when he does not know what you are saying? I don't know how many of you speak in tongues. The tongues aren't what we need right now. We as a we as a Christian people, you as a Christian, it's better to prophesy. It's better to know what God has done so we can know what He's going to do. If our nation turns from its wicked way and it accepts and calls on the name of God, God will heal us. God will restore us. If we don't, then He will continue to let us have it out. You bring all this down to your personal life. And as a Christian, there's, there are some things that you should know. That in, in, in this life, in, in, in this world, you have control of two things. The first is you control what you say. The second is you control what you do. Those are the only thing, two things that you have control over. And if that's the case, my question to you is what are you saying? And my next question to you is what are you doing? Are you calling upon the name of God to save you from the distress? To save you from the oppression? To save you from the torment? Are you trusting and believing and speaking the word of God? If you are saved. If you have called upon the name of Jesus Christ, accepted Him into your heart, then you are the only Jesus that some people will ever meet. So what are you doing? Are you showing them the love of God? Are you speaking the word of truth? A lot of people try to make it harder than it actually is. Our society has made it impossible, or so they believe, to love someone and disagree with them. But that is not so. For God has always told us to hate the sin, but to love.
Hey, you love Fortnite. We, as a nation, need to repent. to act on the love that God has given For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world so that you could live. Not that you could suffer, so you could live. Or are you living for Christ today? Prophecy. The Word. The revelation of the Word of God in your life. In the life of your people. In the life of your nation. Father God, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, as we gather before you today, Father God, of all the, the many, many, many things that you do for us every day, Lord, we, we thank you. Lord, we love you for being the God of our salvation. But Father God, we, we repent of our sins. Father God, we acknowledge that we have fallen short of your glory. Father God, we, we acknowledge that our country is not where it needs to be. Father God, forgive us. Forgive our people. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our lives that we may know that you are the true living God. Bring us to repentance. Father God, bring us into your forgiveness. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. If you'll take your hymnals and turn to hymn 146. Oh, how he loves you. Let's